All right, it's 12 o'clock. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this session of Grand Rounds. I'd like to welcome our presenter for today, Missy Travis, who will be presenting on the topic of cleaning and disinfecting. At this time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn the presentation over to Missy. Thank you so much. Okay, can you confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, ma'am, we can see them. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be with this group again. Um, so today we are going to um, do a presentation using some of the project first line materials. I know that you all have discussed this project before in this forum. Uh, this is just as a quick reminder, this is CDC's a uh, project that they created for frontline healthcare workers. And so um, I'm gonna go through the slides today, um, but also I wanted to let you know that these slides are available on the CDC website and I'll share those resources with you at the end of the presentation. So if you like any of these slides or any of the content, just know that this is available for your use as well. Um, so we kind of have two purposes today. One is just to present the information for your for your information, but also to share the Project First Line uh, tools and materials, just in case you would like to use them yourself. And also um, this particular presentation, there are some um, spots where I'll ask for your participation. So feel free to take yourself off mute or to put your answers into the chat and that will keep it um, a little more interesting for the group. So this is gonna be our agenda for today. We are going to focus primarily on cleaning and disinfection in healthcare and the different components involved in cleaning and disinfection. And these are the objectives that I would like for you to take away from this presentation today. So before we get started, um, I'm going to ask for your participation for a moment and just see if anyone would like to put in the chat or come off mute and tell me what they think a fomite is, if you know the definition of a fomite. And feel free to Google really quick if you need to. Any ideas about what that term fomite means? Well, when we look at the CDC definitions, a fomite is defined as a non-living object contaminated with microorganisms that can spread the microorganisms to other persons. Um, so when we talk about fomite transmission, we're talking about infection that is spread through direct contact with an article or surface like a stethoscope that has become contaminated with infectious material. Um, likewise, when we're looking at contact transmission, this is infection spread through direct contact with an infectious person, uh, touching during a handshake or taking a pulse, or with an article or surface that has that person's infectious material on it, so their environment. And these concepts are really important when we start talking about cleaning and disinfection. It's not always easy to protect ourselves against germs that spread from surfaces. Sometimes we have to break old habits or change the way we think about our work environments. Let's think for a moment about this environment. I'd like for you to close your eyes and really imagine yourself there. Think about all the routines and environments in your daily work. Thinking about this, I'd like you to spend a moment uh, really reflecting on the strategies that you already have in place or some strategies that you could put in place to help keep the spread of germs from surfaces in your facility or organization. So what are some possible strategies we could use to help us remember to protect ourselves against this kind of disease spread? Thinking about what your facility does and what you can do. 
And I encourage you, if you have a creative strategy to share or something that really works well for you, please share it in the chat with others. I've gotten some really great ideas and information from other people that are doing this same kind of work. So I always think there's value in sharing um, ideas or strategies that you've used in the past that have been helpful. So next, we're going to um, ask another question, and I see there are some answers in the chat. Unfortunately, I can't pull up the chat, um, so I may need some help with somebody reading um, what the answers are in the chat. But for this pat particular question, I'd like to know, um, does anyone know the difference between cleaning and disinfection? So you can either put that in the chat um, or come off mute and let me know if you know the difference between the two. And Chelsea, I may need your help reading what's in the chat because I can't see what people are putting in since I'm in presenter mode. Absolutely. I will I will read off the chat. It looks like we just had an answer to what a fomite was before. So anybody you or everybody on the call, you should be able to take yourself off mute by just clicking your, your little icon and then clicking unmute. But if you feel more comfortable putting in the chat, please do so and I will be sure to read it all. Uh, disinfection is a type of cleaning and cleaning is not a type of disinfection. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a, that is um, a really good way of explaining it. So when we look at the definition, um, cleaning removes visible dirt, dust, spills, smears, and grime, including organic material like blood, as well as some germs from surfaces. It's important to clean before disinfecting because dirt and grime can make disinfectants not work as well. And we need disinfectants to work so that they can actually kill the germs on the surfaces or objects. And sometimes um, frontline staff do not understand that there is a difference between the two. Um, so remember that cleaning is an important step because if we try to disinfect something that isn't clean, the disinfectant might not work and we need disinfectant so that we can kill germs. So now let's take a few minutes to talk about why this is so important in healthcare. So cleaning and disinfection are critical in healthcare for many reasons. Um, it's common sense that we don't want a dirty environment for our patients and or our residents. Um, but why is that? Any thoughts as to why cleaning and disinfection matter specifically in healthcare? Both can prevent diseases. Okay, great. So one reason is because in healthcare, we have patients who are ill and may not be able to fight off infections as well as someone who is healthy. Germs are more likely to cause problems in these patients because their immune deficient defenses might not be as strong as someone who's healthy. So why does that matter? Well, it's possible to see how some patients might be at risk of infection, such as if they have burns or wounds, or if they're having a procedure when germs could get into their bodies, such as getting an IV or a catheter. But many patients' risks for infection can't be seen, like when a patient's immune system is weak because of the medication in their cancer treatment. It's important to keep the healthcare environment clean to stop germs from spreading. So think about some of the places um, that need to be cleaned and disinfected often. There are a lot of them in healthcare. So where and when? So first, of course, the most obvious, we think about patient rooms. When a patient leaves a room or is discharged before a new patient goes into that room, it should be cleaned and disinfected to make sure germs don't spread. And what about high touch surfaces? 
We also clean and disinfect things that get touched a lot, such as bed rails, keyboards, and light switches. These high touch surfaces need that frequent cleaning and disinfection. And so what else? It's also important to clean and disinfect things in healthcare that aren't touched or shared as often, but tend to be really dirty and have a lot of germs on them like toilet seats, bathroom handles, sinks, those sorts of things. So one more question I wanna ask the group, does anyone have any idea what the term contact time means? Anyone heard of that term before? And by the way, if you are doing these presentations with your frontline staff, these are some really good questions to ask people just to gauge um, where they are um, in terms of their infection prevention knowledge. So contact time, also called dwell time or wet time, is the amount of time a disinfectant needs to sit on a surface without being wiped away or disturbed to do its job of killing germs. And we talked about earlier with our disinfectants that um, we want to make sure the surface is adequately cleaned, but then we've also got to let the disinfectant sit for an appropriate amount of time so that we do kill all the germs that we want um, killed by that disinfectant. Contact time is important because the product you're using might not kill germs right away. It takes time before all the germs are killed and something is truly disinfected. The time can vary depending on the product, but it is always specific and it should be on the label. Even if you're using a product that both cleans and disinfects all in one, it will still have a contact time that you need to use for it to work correctly. While you can usually judge if something is clean or not just by looking at it, this doesn't work with disinfection. Because germs are too small for us to see, we can't judge how well something has been disinfected by just looking at it. That's why the following instructions when you use disinfecting products is so important. So what information do we need from the label to make sure that we are using it correctly? Well, first of all, in healthcare in the United States, you'll use disinfectants that are registered with the Environmental Protection Agency or the EPA. The EPA is charged with reviewing chemicals used for disinfection to make sure that they're safe and effective. Disinfectants used in healthcare facilities will usually have hospital grade or something similar on the label. Other things you need to know are which surfaces the chemical can be used on, which germs the chemical has been proven to kill, and whether the product should be diluted. That means if it needs to have water or another substance added to it to bring the concentration down so it's safe for use. If so, the label should also tell you how to do that and what to use. And this is something really important to pay attention to because sometimes I have found that I have environmental services texts or housekeeping texts that are um, diluting products and they may not necessarily need to be diluted. And so this is something that's really important to make sure that everyone knows. And of course, the label will tell you the contact time or dwell time or wet time. So we know that we want to use disinfecting products at the right times and correctly, but what do we not want to do? One of the biggest don'ts is don't rush the process. The entire contact time has to finish before something that's been disinfected can be used again, like shared equipment or before a new patient comes into a room after the last patient has been discharged. That's how we can be sure the disinfectant has had time to do its job and kill the germs. 
Don't try to dry a surface that's been disinfected more quickly by wiping with another cloth or by blowing on it with your breath. Also, don't blow air on the surface another way like a fan unless the manufacturer of the product you're using says it's okay. And I told a story about this um, when I presented uh, to this group a couple of weeks ago. We talked about um, where we were in the middle of an outbreak and I noticed that one of the EVS um, technicians who did a really great job cleaning was going back over uh, the sink and some of the other areas with a paper towel and she was not waiting for the complete contact time. She was drying those things before uh, the full time had passed. And be patient. We know this can be tough. Patients may be waiting for rooms and equipment and there may be pressure to move fast, but the risk of spreading germs is too great to rush the process. Following the instructions keeps germs from spreading and keeps your patients and coworkers safe. The EPA has many resources about disinfectants for use in healthcare and lists of disinfectants that are effective against different germs, including SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, the list for SARS-CoV-2 is called List N. Um, and this is one that's come up most frequently when we've been talking about these lists, but there's also lists on the EPA for uh, C. diff. Uh, there's one for Candida auris. And so it's helpful just to go on this website and look around just to see what the different lists are, because especially with some of the multi-drug resistant organisms or the emerging viruses, um, there are products out there that are not effective against those particular um, viruses or bacteria. So you just wanna make sure that whatever you're using in your facility is number one, EPA approved. And if you are focusing on killing a particular type of organism that it is on that specific list. So let's use our last few minutes together in this presentation to reflect on what we've covered today and think about how we can learn more and put what we've learned into practice. I hope this training gave you some good information about cleaning and disinfection and why it's so important um, in healthcare. I've captured some key takeaways here, which you can review at your leisure after the session today. We did cover a lot today and there's still so much more to learn. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you can continue exploring these topics on your own using these resources. Um, you can also follow Project First Line on social media. So if you want to look to see what types of videos and presentations are already on the website that you can use in your facility, you can explore all of these different resources um, and find some of those ready-made tools um, that you can use right now in your facility. So now I'm going to segue into some additional slides that we created as part of the Kentucky Infection Prevention Training Group, um, just to supplement the Project First Line materials that we just went over. So in the Project First Line materials, we were primarily talking about viruses, but it's also important to note that bacteria can also spread on surfaces, including multi-drug resistant organisms, and they can live on surfaces for prolonged periods of time. It's also important to incorporate additional cleaning and disinfection measures when transmission-based precautions are applied. For instance, cleaning those rooms last, so if you have some patients or residents that are on isolation, um, usually the best practice is to wait and clean those rooms last, unless you're in an isolation ward or you've grouped all of those particular patients or residents together. And then it's also important to remember that bacteria and viruses can spread from surfaces to hands to people. And this is a really important concept to understand because oftentimes um, I've found that, especially when people are in isolation and I notice that someone's not wearing all the PPE or they're not doing hand hygiene, one of the most common responses I get is they'll say, well, I'm not touching the patient. 
And so it's important to understand that it's not just the patient. It, it's not only just the patient themselves in which you could uh, possibly um, pick up a bacteria or virus, but it's also the surfaces in that particular environment that you can pick up with your hands and then you can spread to other people and to other surfaces. And also, as we mentioned earlier, certain bacteria and viruses only respond to certain disinfectants. And I've seen this in practice myself. I recently worked uh, with a facility uh, during a candida RS outbreak and they were continuing to have cases. And so we did an on-site visit just to see if we could identify any other issues uh, with the facility and why we were continuing to see cases. And one of the first things that we identified when we were talking to the environmental services staff is they were not using a, dis a disinfectant that was on that EPA list for Candida RS. And so immediately we knew that was one of the things that we needed to change. So this is a good uh, table. Um, and you can see the references below that show the organism and then the days of survival. And I just pulled some of the most common bacteria that you may see in the healthcare environment and how long they can survive on a surface. And this is just important to know and to share with staff so that they can understand if a particular um, item or area is not cleaned and disinfected, that you can still have organisms present um, and persisting on those particular surfaces. And these are just some key points for environmental services. So if you are working with EVS or housekeeping, these are some key points that you can share with them. Um, clean frequently touched surfaces at scheduled times. So I recommend um, creating a schedule, either um, typically twice a day. Uh, just make sure that it is built into the routine. Clean horizontal surfaces, such as countertops, workstations, patients, slash resident areas daily. Always clean the bathroom last. Um, I'll tell you that um, I have been surprised because I thought that this was something that most people knew that we go from clean to dirty, but I will tell you that I have run into this more than once where housekeepers or EVS techs are cleaning the bathroom first. Um, so just important to make sure that they know to clean that last. Um, use an appropriate cleaner for soft surfaces such as fabrics and carpet. Um, it's important to try to avoid soft surfaces if at all possible because they are hard to clean or get items that are made of hospital grade fabric so that they can be cleaned. Ensure that everyone knows the contact time for your disinfectants. This is very important, especially if you're using multiple types of disinfectants. Make sure that everyone knows the different times. Only use hospital approved disinfectants that are registered with the EPA. We already talked about that and make sure that there's a number on the dispenser. Um, I can also tell you when I have gone around and looked at cleaning carts, I have found disinfectants on the cart that are not approved by the EPA that someone has brought in from home or they picked up at the store and know that those are not appropriate to use in the healthcare environment. It's important to try to get a product that cleans and disinfects so you don't have to do two processes. Um, bleach is a really good example here. You know, bleach is, is a good disinfectant, but it's not a good cleaner. So if you're using bleach, just plain old bleach, you have to clean first and then disinfect. And the other thing, um, you know, to note about bleach is that it typically has a 10 minute contact time. And we really want to shoot for the shortest contact time as possible because you all know we're busy in healthcare. We don't always have 10 minutes to spare. If you are using microfiber cloths, be sure they don't bind to your disinfectant if you use a quaternary ammonium product. And so one of the things about microfiber cloths that make them so desirable in healthcare is that they can attract uh, particles such as bacteria and viruses, but the downside to that is they can also attract some of the particles in your disinfectant, uh, particularly if you're using a quaternary ammonium product. And so they're essentially uh, pulling the disinfectant off the surface, and so it's not able to do what it needs to do. So there are some tests where you can check your microfiber cloths, and even if you talk to the person where you get your microfiber cloths, oftentimes they can tell you which products are compatible. Get a product that is safe and clean curtains in rooms on a routine basis and when soiled. 
So this is the uh, million dollar question. How do you know it's clean? And the answer is we never know 100% it's clean, but there are some um, indicators that you can use to um, tell you uh, about the cleanliness process. One is visual checks. Just look at the room to see if is there is it visually clean. Do you notice any dust or dirt anywhere? And a great uh, group of people to ask are the nursing staff. You know, which areas are you noticing? There's dust bunnies. Are you seeing dirt anywhere? Is there a place where you don't typically see anyone cleaning? Um, a checklist is also a good tool that can be completed for each room and area and then signed off by a supervisor. ATP luminometers um, have come into practice in the last several years. You can set limits for the readings and um, it's important though to read the instructions to know how to use these um, in the most effective way. Fluorescent markers have been around for a long time. Um, basically, you use a fluorescent powder or lotion uh, to mark a room before cleaning. And then after it's been cleaned, you go back with a black light and see if any of the fluorescent powder or lotion uh, remains on any of the surfaces, which can indicate that it's not been cleaned appropriately. So finally, I know this sounds like common sense, but you would be surprised how many people do not read the label of the disinfectants that they use. And there's a lot of valuable information on the label. Um, I love this sign from CDC. This is something um, you can download yourself if you think it would be helpful for your EVS staff um, or even your, even your clinical staff, because sometimes they are also using disinfectant wipes and products. Um, but this uh, shows you where you can find the active ingredients, where you can find that EPA registration number, the directions for use, um, which will include your contact time, which we discussed is very important. Um, you want to make sure that everyone knows the first aid and precautionary statements. The last thing you want to do is wait until someone has been splashed in the eyes to be looking at the first aid information. You want to make sure that everyone's aware of that before something happens. And then storage and disposal, disposal is also really important because we want to make sure that our disinfectants are stored appropriately so that we can assume that they are going to work correctly when we're using them to clean um, patient and resident areas. So that is my last slide for the presentation. So I will open it up for questions if anyone has any questions about cleaning and disinfection today. Quite a, quite a group today, Missy. Well, um, well, I want to thank you for this great reminder on how we as healthcare workers can assist our frontline staff who may need additional reminders. I know speaking personally for myself, but sometimes I'll skip over those basics. To, uh, so that was a great reminder. And for those participants who are looking for resources that, that have already been developed as a tool to help your frontline staff, please do not hesitate to reach out. And I'll get you in contact with Missy or send you the links that she provided in those slides. So I want to thank everyone for joining today and we'll see you next week.